All right, welcome to This and That with Terry and Allie. I know we're starting a little bit early here to, you know, let people uh, file in. So this uh, month we are talking about sewing machine spa days. This is the, our owner here at the Electric Needle. This is Jen, and um, she's going to our head technician here. She's going to be talking about maintenance you can do at home with your sewing machine. So. That will be um, in, a, in a little bit here, right away at uh, 5.30 when that uh, rolls around. But I know we've got some other coming videos. I know Quilt Expo, for anybody who's excited for that, they're going to be planning some videos. So stay tuned. Um, might be some more info later on here, but know that we're going to have some videos for those. So um, we'll kind of let people tune in here uh, for another little bit. And then uh, we'll start right away with sewing machine spa days. So anything else exciting coming up new here at the Electric Needle Gen? Well, we've got, um, you know, we're adding classes all the time. We are still doing in-person classes. Uh, we are closed on Labor Day. So we're all taking a long weekend. Don't, uh, don't try to shop here that day, please. Um, we also, um, if you have questions during the presentation, don't hesitate to go ahead and uh, put those in the comments below and we'll try to answer them. I'm trying not to be very specific about, you know, individual machines. Um, however, if I, if I can answer the question, I definitely will try. All right, so that means I think we are right right at 5.30 here. So uh, let's go ahead and get started on this. And again, if you have any questions, um, put them right away in the comments and we'll, we'll answer them kind of during the presentation here. So, Jen? So, uh, so I just want to talk briefly first um, about uh, who I am. I am the owner of The Electric Needle. My name is Jen Mulder. Uh, we are a Fuff Viking singer and handy quilter certified repair shop. We can service other makes and models of machines. We just can't always get access to parts. And so sometimes we will ref, you know, refer. We have over, now it's 12 years, I didn't update my little um, presentation of service experience and um, all of our technicians are also sewists. 99.95% uh, of the machines that we work on stay here, so they don't travel anywhere. And right now we are looking at a two week turnaround unless we're ordering parts. And we found that happy pandemic fun times means that parts can be difficult um, to get. Um, one thing that frustrates a lot of people out there is that we can't sew when our machine is in for repair. And so we really focus here on, you know, getting you on a maintenance schedule so that you can rest assured that you don't have to have a delay because it's repair rather than maintenance. Um, all and manufacturers recommend annual maintenance on the sewing machines, um, but there are some exceptions to that. If, what if sewing is my job? What if sewing is my passion? What if I only sew every few months? And so um, what we would like to do is help people figure out their schedule. Um, you know, it's kind of like an oil change sticker every so many miles or so many months. Um, also, what you sew makes a difference. So if you are producing flannel, you know, baby burpy things and, you know, working with flannel, 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 or doing a lot of quilt sandwiches um, where you've got the batting and the backer and the top and, um, or other really fuzzy things like velvet or faux fur, things that kind of like to make a mess. Uh, your machine may get full faster than if you don't do those things. We totally encourage you to do all the things. Just be aware that that may change your maintenance schedule. So in the presentation, we're gonna explore a general overview of the parts and functioning of the sewing machine. I'm going to um, talk a little bit about some common statements that we make in your tech report, because sometimes we read it off really fast to you and it all just goes, yeah. <laughs> I know I'm the same way when people are telling me about, you know, my car or other things. So um, I'll also touch on a checklist of what you should be doing at home. And again, I'm happy to try to answer any questions that you have. And so um, the general parts of the sewing machine, uh, the chassis, uh, the sewing head, and that includes the uptake lever, needle bar, presser bar, 
dual feed system if you have that, um, a needle threader if you have that. Usually there's lighting and a tension unit and a check spring. Um, there's an upper shaft, there's a lower shaft, there's uh, either a timing belt or a timing fork in your machine. You've got a motor and motor belt or belts if it's not a treadle. Um, and then, or a hand crank machine, have you seen those? I have one, that's super fun. Um, you've got a feed system and a hook. These are the main parts of all sewing machines. It's different if it's a serger, we're just focusing on sewing machines today. So this is an example of a chassis. The chassis is the metal portion of this machine that everything gets mounted to and adjusted on. And so today's chassis are mostly aluminum. Some machines um, may just be using the rigid plastic cover as the chassis, um, but there is some sort of structure holding your machine together. And that's what we refer to as the chassis. These are two pictures of a sewing head, and the one on the right is a mechanical machine, and so it has a bunch of arms and levers that do the work for the machine. The one that is on the left is going to be an electronic machine, and so you can start to see some of these silver motors in there that are actually going to do the functions of the machine for you. Then we've got, um, in this picture, you can see shafts and then a motor and a belt. And so we're looking at this big heavy shaft up here and then that big heavy shaft down there. So those are the two upper and lower shafts. Some machines will actually have a vertical shaft here, gears on both the top and the bottom. And then we've got a motor here with a motor belt that's gonna run the upper shaft and then the timing belt to make it work with the lower shaft. This is a picture of a feed system. Oftentimes we think the feed system, we think the feed dogs, and they're the part on the outside that we can see of the machine. And so, but the feed system on this machine includes this upper horseshoe piece that goes all the way around the hook, this lower horseshoe piece. It's also got some forks that go back. This is our feed step motor. We've got a box slide and a couple sets of gears in there. This piece is also a part of the feed system on this machine. Because it has the integrated dual feed, that's gonna go, that's the linkage that goes up to the walking foot behind the, um, on the back of the head of the machine. And that's uh, mostly for FOF machines, correct? Yep. Viking has a few that also have it. Um, I know some other brands, brands have something similar, but the feed system is just, I want you to know, it's generally, it's bigger than simply your, you know, your awesome feed dogs. Woof, woof, woof. So those are the parts of the machine. And now briefly, I just wanna show you some, you know, some things that happen. And when we say there was a lot of fuzz, well, just how much fuzz was a lot of fuzz? Um, this was, a person who uh, admittedly skipped cleaning for a while. And so we had, you know, handfuls of fuzz come out of that machine. We also, this one is the same, that feed system picture we just looked at. It's kind of, we call this, it's got a beard. Sometimes we take the cover off and the beard just like falls forward out of the machine. And so because today's machines are really closed up, um, if we're, you know, blowing air in there, we can really kind of see where the fuzz ends up. And it can become fully compacted and keep things from being able to move, which is not a good, not a good thing. Um, if we say your drive gears are compacted, this is the same machine. When we took the cover off, you can see there's all of that fun stuff in there and some of it dropped down here and it's pretty, it's glittery and fun, but here's the gears. So that is all sitting with the function that turns your hook to form your stitch. And so getting that out of there and getting these gears, the lubrication that they need is essential to keep your machine performing correctly. Oftentimes we'll note that we find threads in places where they shouldn't be. And so here we've got some in this gear. This is also a drive gear and there is some fuzz in there. We took the cover off and you can just see the threads hanging down. There's another place where we've got them around a drive gear or a drive shaft. And then this is over where the hand wheel comes off the machine in two different instances here. A couple different brands, you might recognize one or the other. When this happens, this can actually melt your cover. And we've seen it where it got so hot because there's so much thread in there that it actually melts the cover and the cover bonds itself back together and we literally have to break it apart to get the cover off. And so if you find that you've got threads wrapping inside your hand wheel, 
that might be an indication that you should bring it in and we should address that before, <laughs> before it causes some damage. There's another place in the sewing head. Um, so this is up where your thread path would come down this way and go up to your uptake lever. When it starts to get all wrapped up in there, that can actually stop your machine from turning or working at all. Um, thread is, you know, it, it, we think it's so delicate and light, but it is actually mighty. And it can be very str strong. <laughs> and it can shift things out of alignment and make things go clackety clack. So um, if, you, if you know you've got threads in your machine and you're concerned, we're always happy to take a look at that. Fuzz can also be an issue. And so in these two photos, you've, um, these are two different styles of check spring. And the check spring keeps your thread from jumping out of your uptake lever, generally speaking, or moving where it shouldn't when it's uptaking the thread that came around your hook to make your stitch. And so the check spring, when it is full of fuzz, um, in both of these instances it is, that can actually keep it from being able to check. It also can cause some serious tension problems. And in machines that have upper thread sensors, it can make the upper thread sensor no longer function. Or it can make it just say, you have no thread. Hey, you have no thread. And then you can't sew. And that's annoying. <laughs> can this also cause uh, thread breakage if you have cotton or thin threads? It could. It can also break the check spring, which would also not be a good scenario. <laughs> Certainly not. No. Um, these are a couple of cutters, and oh the too many threads or too much fuzzy business, like you can kind of see that little lump of fuzz there. We've got a couple threads here and a bunch of fuzz in that thread cutter style. Um, threads and the fuzz buildup around the cutters can also wreak havoc with those. And so um, that is something you could check with your manufacturer to see if you're allowed to go ahead and move and clean that on your own. Some are easier to do than others at home. And then old grease. So grease and oil are the two main lubricants that we use inside sewing machines when we're doing maintenance. The grease that was in that old machine, that, that is a solid chunk of grease. And you can see where it has discolored because it kind of got burnt by the gears. That grease isn't doing anything but sitting in there and hardening. Um, over here, we can see this grease. That should be a black pin above a silver shaft and it's at this point it's um kind of powdery and very rigid and so we would have to scrape that off there to get that to get new uh, grease in there today we don't use a um, natural grease that would you know do this eventually today we use a synthetic grease and so that, that's not going to happen with the grease we're adding to your machine. But um, if this does happen, oftentimes it's your presser bar won't lift. Um, you've got your hand wheel is gripping and it won't turn anymore. Um, we can see it with the drive gears. There's, there's a number of places we find that. Belts can wear out and, and break. You can see this one is totally losing its teeth. And it's just a couple strings going around the two pulleys. This one here um, is actually disintegrating on the inside. And as, as soon as we try to tighten this to make it run, it's just going to go poof <laughs> and give up the ghost. So belts do wear out. And that's a couple examples of that. And this is also the same for the bobbin winding ring. Is that correct? Yes. The bobbin winding ring is generally a little, um, basically a rubber ring and they get brittle, they melt, they do all sorts of fun things. And then if we discuss wear, wear is generally where you've got probably some old lubricant or a lack of lubricant, and you're starting to get little bits of metal wearing against each other, and they've kind of produced this black um, sticky business. And so oftentimes we'll lubricate something and then we'll start to see the wear coming out of a bushing. So this would be the bushing here and that would be the presser bar in this example. Here we've got it cleaned up and we're no longer seeing that. Um, wear is generally an indicator that something is actually starting to fail. Oftentimes you can run with a machine that has you know, wear depending on where it is in the machine um, a while yet. Um, it's not necessarily like your machine is gonna die. Um, because we never hate, would like to say that. We, that we, you know, we try to keep them going as long as they can. Um, but it is, it is something to, to see if you have no idea what, what we mean when we say that. 
And where are the most common places they might find where, like if we were to write it in notes? Yeah, so the needle bar, the needle bar moves a lot. It moves a great distance. Um, either the upper or the lower shaft bushings are another place where we see where a bunch. Um, the uptake lever actuators that you know actually make that move, those have a pretty good rotation every time the needle moves up and down, and so they're another place where we see it as well. Old oil in the machine, it can pool. This stuff in this machine actually turned into lacquer. You can like poke that with a stick and it's not gonna, not gonna go anywhere. Um, and so we do, you know, try to remove puddles like that if we see them just because we don't want them in there. Um, especially if the machine gets tipped for some reason, that could not be good moving all around in there. Um, and then these are some funny things we found in machines. I just, uh, that's a lizard of some sort. This machine came up here from the Southwest and they're like, oh, we had those little guys all over everywhere. And so apparently one got in the machine and unfortunately didn't get back out. We found Repairman. That's Repairman and I bought him a rubber chicken because I just needed to. Um, so yeah, and he also sometimes carries a swab. And then this is a machine that has a whole bunch of fun stuff in it. You know, we've got some mylar, we've got some sequins, we've got some pretty heavy threads. We've got, you know, red and green and just a whole, a whole bunch of fun. So we see beads, we see pins, we see, you know, lots of things, it's fun. So now I'm going to discuss what you should be doing for your machine at home, okay? So there are a few things that I just, I don't mean to be negative. Um, however, the first thing I have to say is that you should only turn screws that you're sure should be turned. Um, and even when taking off your stitch plate, um, some of them pry, some of them you have to take the screws out, some of them you don't touch those screws and you just pop it off of them. Usually that would be a Phillips head screw, um, but there are a number of setting screws that can be accessed from the outsides of the machines. And if you're turning a setting screw, you could make it so the machine no longer functions. And so um, just fair warning, <laughs> if you're not familiar with which screws you need to be turning, probably don't turn them. Um, Another thing I encourage is that you listen to the changes in how your machine sounds. That can kind of give you an indicator of, you know, my bobbin's running out, my needle's getting dull, um, you know, maybe, maybe something else. I know um, I sometimes change my needle just based on what it sounds like with what I'm sewing. And it might not be my needle's going bad, it might just be I really shouldn't be lazy and leave my Universal 80 in there. Um, so listening to it is definitely going to help you in the long run. Um, I also recommend that you use the highest quality threads that you can. Um, a lot of times that, you know, really has to do with less lint, better performance, prettier stitches, um, and then, a, you know, a longer lasting end result. Your machine will also thank you for it if it's not getting gummy and gluey and all of that. Also, you know, only threads that are meant for a sewing machine. So when you're listening to sounds, you can also tell when your sound, your machine gets dry, right? Yes, yes. I would say you could, um, you could hear if your machine is getting dry um, or if you, you know, it starts to sound labored. That, that would be another indicator that maybe, maybe it's time to, you know, give it a spa day. Um, <laughs> So you, I do recommend that you figure out how to do it for your machine. It's not the same for every machine, but dusting it out from time to time, every say eight to 10 full bobbins you go through, unless you've been sewing like some of those fuzzy things we talked about earlier, you know, faux fur, flannel, quilting a ton, what it, velvets, yeah. minkies, wools, all of these things are gonna be more fuzzy and that's just the nature of what they are. Um, and what material or what, what tool would you actually find to be the best to do that with? So when you're cleaning the dust out, um, I find I use the tip of my seam ripper to poke out between my feed dogs. Um, so I just, it's already there, it's little, it's pointy. 
<laughs> so after I've taken off the stitch plate, I'm gonna poke that out with my seam ripper at home. And then I have a little um, box that has cotton swabs in it. And so the cotton on the end of the cotton swab actually grabs the fuzz. I know most of the machines come with a little brush but the brush sort of seems to move things around rather than actually get them out. I get if you're working on a serger where you can kind of tip it and brush, then fine, gravity's pulling the stuff out. But most sewing machines, you're actually kind of poking down in there. It also, um, the cotton swab is really not gonna hurt anything in there. If you go in with a bunch of, you know, metal things or rigid things, let's say you've got a low bobbin sensor and you, um, poke it with a stylus or something, um, then it might not alert you because you might have changed the angle for the laser because those are all laser sensors. Um, so you don't want to put anything, you know, you don't want to go poking down in there with too many sharp things. Mm -hmm. I only use the seam ripper for between the feed dogs. Okay. So also, um, you know, like sometimes I sew with some of that sticky back stabilizer or some of the newer um, knits have those glued on sequins and stuff. So that glue gets in like on the needles, on the feet, in the machine. How would you recommend cleaning that until they can get into the shop for good cleaning? So if you do find that you have an adhesive residue, I would still be using that cotton swab, but I would be um, taking a little bit of 91% rubbing alcohol and dipping lightly squeeze out the excess you don't want it dripping down into your machine because if it gets on a place that needs to be oiled or greased that can start to dissipate those lubricants so you want to be very sparing with it and go ahead and you know wipe off the tip of your hook the underside of the hook the underside of the feed dog the needle those would be the places where it would start to build up the bobbin case as well um, and then you could use also a you know folded square of cotton to, to do a little bit of that cleaning with some rubbing alcohol if you find that the cotton swab, especially if it's a plastic stick, is not, um, not working good enough. Um, we do recommend that you keep track of the service so too much time doesn't slip by before having it professionally serviced again. Um, and then you know keeping it out of moisture. We have winter here and so um, if you've had it outside for, you know, in a, in a cold environment and it got cold, you want to let it warm up before you um, use it in winter after bringing it in. If you moved it from the house to the car, you drove, your car was warm, you weren't sitting there freezing in a park while you're driving and then you bring it to class, you're probably fine. However, if you took it to work in the back of your car and you were at work and your car was outside all day, and then you drove to your cabin, you gotta let it warm up. Um, turning it on, booting it up, running it is going to encourage condensation to happen. And so letting it come up to speed naturally is gonna limit that risk. Um, and then also avoid canned air. Um, I, I mentioned this earlier, I think. I said, mm -hmm. you know, with most machines and the way that the bodies are constructed, you really, um, you're pushing the fuzz deeper into the machine. And so um, unless you really are able to get your machine open, which some of them you can, some of the, you know, some of the older ones are like that, uh, you, wanna, you wanna avoid the canned air. So what about, um, someone's asking, um, what about a small vacuum cleaner? Like we have, do we have, don't we have someone here, mm -hmm. right? Yes, yes. So um, I do keep a shop back in my sewing studio and I primarily use it for my serger. Um, however, I do, uh, I, we do vacuum the fuzz out of machines. There is very little um, risk in that. I would like hold the vacuum outside of the machine and use the um, cotton swab to sort of like flick or move the fuzz towards mm -hmm. the vacuum, that, is, that should be totally acceptable. There are going to be, um, in some machines though, some fuzzy, we call them caterpillars. Sometimes they're on the bobbin case, sometimes they're by the cutter, um, sometimes they're in the head by the thread path. And if, it, if it's like a furry sort of caterpillary thing, it might actually need to be there. 
And so don't go too overzealous if you find something that seems like it's stuck in a specific place. Um, because those actually exist as well. Um, but regular dusting out goes something like this. First, you have to take off the stitch plate. And so we've taken the stitch plate off this machine. Um, this one had two screws. You can see my little screw holes here. And so now um, we've, we've made access here. And so we've got, obviously, a bunch of fuzz. So we would start by removing this fuzz. OK, so uh, Marion's asking the question um, that we need to keep track of servers. She's thinking about regular servers. Is it generally once per year? I know you kind of went through that a little bit about if you sew a lot or if you, she'd like a little bit more information on a service record. Yeah, so all sewing machine um, manufacturers recommend an annual service on your machine. Um, and so if you have a machine, I know some of us have more than one machine. Um, the machine that I mainly sew on, I'm on a six month plan. That's my main machine, that's what I do. I do my surgery like that as well. Um, my featherweight, I don't sew on it. I service it every other year. But I still service it every other year, just to make sure that it stays lubricated and it stays happy, as I don't want to find the thing locked up and have to go through stripping that. Um, I have a couple of other machines, and depending on their usage, you know, it, it's more likely annual. So just... Um... This is Terry, by the way. Um, I sew professionally, so I get my machines serviced by Jen before I go out of town to work, and then I get them serviced the minute I get back from a sewing job. So people who are traveling to different, like say we have snowbirds, some of them are going to Florida or something. Um, you're going through different altitudes uh, down in Florida. I know my, I'm always sending machines back from Florida because they don't see, I, I don't know if it's the salt water or the air or what's going on down there, but I notice my machine has to be serviced more when I go to like ocean type water right. areas. So, yep. Okay. Yeah, it, it's very individual. We definitely have people that are on a four month plan um, and they're doing production work with some of these fibers that are, you know, significantly different. So, mm -hmm. Marion also wants to know can we make appointments for service? So currently we are allowing that. I am revisiting the model just because we're post COVID and we're at two weeks turnaround time. Currently we, we do have time slots open um, here and there. And what we end up doing is saying that it'll be just a few days when you bring it. And we do want you to bring it um, you know, early or as early in the day as possible so that we can you know, work through the machines that we have scheduled. Usually, um, usually then it's two or three days but that's really only for maintenance uh, we certainly can't guarantee a two to three day turnaround time on anything that requires parts or repair yeah yeah um is it let me know in the comments if you want me to keep that because i'm considering not having it anymore just because we're back to a two-week turnaround time so um, the next step after getting the um, stitch plate off is, of course, to go ahead and clean between the feed dogs. Um, on these two examples here, you can see this stuff was all around the feed dogs. We haven't cleaned in between the feed dogs on this one yet. Um, that guy, so this is, this, is, <laughs> this is when we took it off. This stuff is here. You know, we just did around the outside, but we still on this picture need to go in between the feed dogs. And that's what I was saying I used my seam ripper for because it's little and it fits in there. And then you want to take those things out um, of the machine. If you find that your machine isn't feeding well and you realize, oh, I haven't cleaned between my feed dogs in a while. If you take your stitch plate off and you look underneath it, you can actually sometimes it burnishes the stitch plate to a really high shine because it gets so compacted in there and that that can be hard on the motor we don't want we don't want to have that happen to your machine um, then you want to remove the bobbin case and these this happens to be top loading bobbin case um, you would remove the bobbin case and the hook if you had a front loader if, if your front loader has the little arms and it can come apart um, and so here you can see we haven't cleaned the feed dogs yet, but we took the bobbin case out. That was before. Here we're starting to 
clean the fuzz out. And so there's, you know, fairly large chunks of fuzz can come out of the machines. And the fuzz actually starts to suck up your lubrication and make your machine dry. And then it's going to sound funny and that's not going to be good. Um, on the next slide here, we've got um, a couple examples of oiling your machine. So I would say 85% of today's machines do not require consumer oiling. They require maintenance and oiling by a professional during your annual spa day. However, um, there are still some machines that are produced today that do require consumer oiling. Okay, your manual will tell you if it requires it. If you've got metal on metal on metal in your hook area, um, and uh, it's mainly gonna be front-loading machines. Um, only top loading machines with metal bobbin cases, and those are some of the, um, you know, the old Singer 66 style machines. So here, this is the one that I was talking about where if you're gonna clean it in there for this machine, you would pop these two little arms to the sides and actually take out the bobbin case and the hook and then the race. This one is also a front loader and it's got a metal bobbin case. You would remove the bobbin case, but you can't take this hook apart. That's not something you can do. You can clean in there and you wanna oil it. Both of these are examples of things that you want to oil, um, but this one you can't take farther apart. You can over oil your machine and that can cause stitch issues, cable issues if it's electronic and um, you know, really icky oily thread getting all over your project. So I, I don't, I, it's a caution, don't over oil. If you spill a bunch of oil in there, try to clean it up as much as you can and then you know, run it with cotton on cotton and try to, you know, get that excess oil out of there. So I've had a couple of questions about this in the store, but is there a specific oil you should be using? Yes, we have, we have a sewing machine oil and we, we sell it in a little bottle. Um, it's, a, it's a typical machine oil, it's a clear oil. Um, that's the one that I recommend. Um, if, you're, if you find an oil bottle with a sewing machine, you can tell if it's bad, oil goes bad. Um, if you put a little drop either on a you know, piece of white cotton or a paper towel, um, and if it's any color but wet looking, if it's any color but white still, starts to discolor at all, it's bad, toss it. I mean, keep the can if you think it's cute, like you know, in the Slinger Featherweight boxes, but, um, but don't use that oil in your machine. Your, your machine will thank you for it. Yes. Good call. <laughs> So then we want you to check your machine for other cleaning tasks. So um, you're gonna check the needle bar, you're gonna check the thread path, you're gonna check the thread cutter if you have one. Um, we recommend that you regularly replace any tape markings to ensure that the glue is fresh. Um, masking tape, scotch tapes, they're all kind of irritating to remove when they're dry up and can be can be annoying to your project. This picture here is a needle bar on this machine and we've got rainbow colored fluff. And so that we would call a fuzz donut and it's a really big donut and it's gonna start sucking the oil out of the bushing for that needle bar and that could lead to wear over time. Um, so this is, you know, check it. Is there fuzz up there? Get the fuzz out of there. We don't want that fuzz there, okay? Um, we also recommend to strip goop from spool stickers off the spool pins, um, especially if they're upright, because that, um, that sticky residue can actually cause your spools to not turn correctly and can give you tension problems and stitching issues. And finally, your machine wants to be run. Don't neglect it. Um, it they want to be run. It's, it's like a car. You let it sit and then things can be bad or mice can move in or lizards. Or, or other things. We have a special guest. Come join us. Come join us, Katie. Katie used to be part of our team, and she's come in for a visit, so we're all going to say hello. 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 So, Thank you. Um, so, so, yeah, that's, that's what I got. You got any questions? Do, did you have any questions? No. Have awesome. I been, have it been thorough and on time? I think you, you, you're very on time. More Woo! on time than what Terry and I usually are. <laughs> hey, 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 hey. hey. <laughs> it's true. So um, 
All great. Thanks. Thank you, Jen, for guest appearing on this month's This and That with Terry and Allie. I know next month we have Terry, which uh, leads us segue into September's is going to be all about Halloween. It's Yay! Be September's spooktacular. And we're going to be talking about all sorts of Halloween stuff. So I think there, uh, I heard there might be some uh, Facebook uh, sneak peeks coming up here. Cool. Maybe early September to give you more info on what's coming up for the this and that. So stay tuned on Facebook for those. Um, other than that, if uh, again, if you have more questions, um, you can always comment in the bottom of the video here. And we do, we do check the comments after the video. So. Or reach out. I mean, send an or reach email. Out. Give call a call. Us, bring email. it in. All sorts of things. We're here for you. So thank you for joining us, and uh, we look forward to seeing you again next month.